Classical education is friends and enemies. For many people, liberal arts education is just a classical education. It's an education that is happening more or less as it used to be in ancient Greece, or at least that's what they thought. It's education in which you are not going to be learning how to code, but you are going to read a lot of Plato. And to be honest, in some examples of liberal education, this is certainly true. Uh, but not in all of them, and the history of, what, uh, of, uh, of arguments about the place of classical tradition in the liberal arts education is actually quite a fascinating one. I think there are at least two main approaches to the classical education. One of them is the traditional education, and uh, the traditional approach would mean that, well, classical education is what used to happen at medieval universities, what in some places continues to happen in more or less an unchanged form uh, until today. And this is an education that is more that, that is centered around the trivium and quadrivium, uh, meaning around the, the, the pretty much the medieval curriculum. Uh, the difficulty of this interpretation is that, of course, uh, people are learning more than that, uh, but at least the main argument is that people should be, should be taught at the first level, they should be, be taught grammar, dialectic or logic and, uh, and rhetoric. Uh, and then uh, once they master that, they are ready to do, well, what we would call mathematics, so arithmetic, geometry, music and astronomy. Uh, it is not something that sounds appealing. It is not something that is happening in this direct sense in many places, but when you look at the curricula of many institutions, you would see that, uh, that there are some modern interpretations of the same subject. People are taught how to write, people are taught how to do public speaking, people are taught logic pretty much in the same form, or history of philosophy, and people, people are taught uh, materials from mathematics and natural sciences as an understanding that every educated person should have something like that. But the traditional interpretation of classical education does not view those subjects as a value in itself. The, the most classical arguments for classical education, if I can call it this way, were fairly instrumental. Uh, they were saying that, for example, uh, this mode of learning and that back then was delivered, was centered around the Latin text and the Greek text, and the knowledge of classical languages on top of the whatever content they were learning uh, is here to develop the discipline and furniture of mind, as the Yale report of 1928 was famously arguing. Uh, people like, like John Henry Cardinal Newman were saying that this is the real cultivation of the mind, that the, the, the main point of learning those kind of uh, subjects outside of our world uh, is not because they are useful, it's not even because they in themselves are the pinnacle of human achievement, but because this is a proven way of developing a human intellect, and the more difficult it becomes for us, the more obvious it should be that we should be continue to do that, because, it's no, because it becomes more and more of a tool to achieve something else. So there is the, the traditional interpretation that looks more or less along those lines, uh, and it has obvi obviously some problems, right? I mean, the, the, the traditional approach was based on recitation, there wasn't too much active learning, uh, fewer and fewer people know Latin, if they know Latin they are typically from upper class right now, because this is, became a, a matter of distinction of, of some selective honors high schools to have the Latin in the curriculum, whereas everyone else is more or less excluded from that, then people are using that as a marker of their social status and, and so far and so forth. But there is also another interpretation of the classical education, and that's the, pretty much the great books interpretation of, of, the, of the classical education, in which which you do not read great books because they make you smarter, because they make you faster, because they make you better in communicating with people or, uh, or prepared to win an argument. You read them because they are important. And they are important because people disagree about their value, but they are talking about the ideas that, according to proponents of great books, are very close to the human nature that all humans have, are struggling and have been struggling for centuries with certain problems and certain ideas uh, and we're disagreeing about certain values that those books represented and uh, argued about uh, and the disagreements between those books are becoming a history of our civilization and it's very difficult to argue that you can be an educated person in any civilization if you don't know how this civilization has developed. 
Now, the great books have been invented in that sense uh, in at least three different places, which is the uh, Columbia uh, University of Chicago and, for example, St. John's College. All of them have slightly different interpretations of those. Some of them still exist in some changed form. Uh, uh, many examples of great books have disappeared fairly quickly. Uh, but they were a reaction to the rise of the research university and the disciplinary thinking and the kind of a soulless education that Americans were pursuing. It is quite interesting that the great books have not caught up in Europe, although 80 to 90 percent of authors they are reading are in Europe. It is also quite fascinating that the great books tradition as itself uh, is uh, based on English. So people are reading those great books, but they are reading them in translation and there is no real expectation for you to read those great books in original language. Uh, as, for example, there is an expectation like this from theologians to read the scripture in the original language, right? So, so this tradition has, uh, has developed in, in there and it has been quite, I would say, um, attractive to a range of people in Europe over the last 30 years and even to this institution to, to think that in some ways we will never have a complete liberal arts education if we continue to ignore the great books whatsoever. But we need not to fool ourselves. This is a minority of programs that have any kind of great books components uh, because they have been accused, and not without a reason, of being exclusive, of uh, being not helpful of, uh, for, the, for the education in the late 20th century, uh, of there being an easier and more effective ways of getting similar content or similar way of, of doing things. Uh, so the traditionalists would say it's not traditional enough, the progressives would say it still doesn't resolve any of the problems that we have. So, so the, the classical education in whatever shape has at least three main enemies for the last 100 years. The first enemy is of course the research university. If the university is making you a chemist or a historian, you should be learning this particular matter, not something else. You have limited time to get uh, there and the university is the only place in the world where you can be at the, the cutting edge of research, uh, close to people who can do this kind of research, so why should you be wasting your time or why the university should be wasting their resources on teaching you something that is not connected to that research. Uh, great books are not about specialization, all the research is about increasing specialization and becoming more and better and better in one particular direction, so it's a kind of a different ideal of education. The second uh, argument against classical education is of course that it's not useful. Uh, it's better to learn agriculture, it's better to learn business, it's better to learn marketing maybe or uh, optics. There are very few examples in which any kind of vocational institution or vocationally inclined institution would include a great books uh, tradition, not to mention the, the trivium and quadrivium. Uh, and that goes back to the, to the land grant universities from mid 19th century that were built to, devil, to, to teach students both mechanicals and liberal arts. But people for, have forgotten pretty much about the second part and the focus on the first one. And lastly, there is an assault on the grade books and the classical education more, more generally uh, from the progressives who are saying that, well, uh, grade books are always going to be uh, uh, far away from the direct experience of the students. Uh, they are not going to help them uh, locate themselves in the contemporary world. There are a lot of problematic uh, claims made in the grade books. Uh, and actually we should, uh, we should not stop doing that, we should start doing something that is more relevant for our students, that is something that is better way of making our society more just or uh, more, uh, you know, ingenious. Uh, and the great books are just kind of a thing of the past that, uh, well, it happened, but right now we shouldn't be doing that anymore. So there are, I would say that, that in, in, in general the, the classical education is not doing very well in the world, especially when, when we start asking ourselves the question why should people in uh, the whole world read just one civilization and how, how to overcome the, the limitations uh, of, of this particular perspective that was written for a particular uh, cultural uh, area in mind uh, in an increasingly global and mobile uh, society. There are examples uh, in, the, in the world like Association of Cortex and Courses uh, who are trying more or less successfully to reinterpret or update the ideal of great books uh, 
uh, into something that will be valuable in itself or for some other purposes and uh, spread this across the world. But you should note that they are no longer talking about great books, they are no longer talking about classical education, they are talking about core texts in the understanding that there is some body of, of texts that all of the education people, all of the educated people should know. And it's up to us probably to, to decide whether we believe that those texts really exist and if so, what are our arguments to convince those that are not convinced.